Hey everyone, it's Matt. Today I just want to do an essentials video about continuous probability distributions. I'm going to go through a couple of ideas quickly, then we'll do a few examples uh, in full detail, and then I'll leave a few more examples for you to work through. So previously we've been thinking about discrete probability distributions, where before we had a discrete probability density, something like what we have below here. Uh, recall that all the probabilities for each event happening, uh, event 1, 2, 3, 4, all of these probabilities will sum to 1. We believe that out of all the possible outcomes with 100% chance, at least one of them should happen. For probability uh, density that is continuous, uh, it's a similar idea, but there are a few differences. Everything is nice and smoothed out. So we have a nice smooth curve giving us our probabilities here. The total area under the curve is still 1. However, the height of this curve is not the probability. Instead, it's areas between different ranges. So this gray shaded area here corresponds to the probability of being below uh, this point x here. Uh, we'll get a chance to play with this shortly um, in an example. There is, uh, because now all of a sudden we're dealing with areas under curves, uh, integral calculus starts to come into play. We won't uh, be doing integrals or dealing uh, with them, but we will note the following. So as we say, the total area under the curve is 1. That's similar to the sum of the probabilities being 1. And uh, similar to our requirement for discrete probabilities that all of the individual probabilities should be between 0 and 1, we have the similar thing for the function. So any area we compute of the function between any two points should be less or equal to 1, and all of the points on the function themselves should be greater or equal to 0. Uh, we have some formulas for mean and standard deviation. Uh, computing these requires some integral calculus, so we will not uh, be doing that in this course. Uh, this next example here is going through where we have a uniform distribution. Uh, so this is just a flat distribution here where all outcomes are equally likely. So for example, uh, here we have a capacitor that might last between 0 and 3 minutes. Uh, the probability that it lasts between 0 and 3 minutes is 100%. But we could ask questions about the probability maybe of it lasting between 0 and 2 minutes, uh, which we could comp compute by finding the corresponding area. So you could find this area here. Uh, turns out to be 0.666. This will tell you the probability of the capacitor lasting between 0 and 2 minutes. Uh, one of the interesting differences between continuous probability distributions and discrete probability distributions is that we are no longer so picky about less than or less than or equal to. Uh, whether or not you include this line for the half makes no difference. Uh, either this line is there or this line is not, but the line has no area, and so when we compute the area, it's the same thing. So there's an equal sign here or there's not an equal sign here, same deal. Uh, with that said, uh, if you ask a question of what is the probability that we will be exactly one, then in this case, uh, since we have no area, under 1 we just have kind of this line here. There's no area to the line, and so the probability of getting exactly 1 happens to be 0. Uh, we could instead, like in the next example, consider probability in some range around 1. That's something we could compute. That's actually a rectangle. Uh, but an exact value has probability 0. So I just wanted to go through uh, those ideas briefly 
uh, you can take a look uh, more slowly through in the notes later. Uh, we won't often be working with a uniform distribution. Instead, we will most likely be working with the normal distribution, which is featured here. The normal distribution has a complicated formula. And in order to find the area under the curve, uh, like this shaded area in gray here, uh, we would have to maybe look it up on a table or else use a particular function in R. So we can use the P norm function in R, which will take the X value we're moving up to, the mean and the standard deviation in order to find our total probabilities. Uh, so this is the distribution we'll be working with most often. Uh, let's see a couple of examples now. So let's consider maybe the standard normal distribution. So this is a normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. A uh, good example for this is temperature. So let's consider a certain brand of thermometer. Uh, maybe the average freezing point for all of our thermometers is zero and the standard deviation is one. And let's assume that all of our thermometers are normally distributed around this mean. We can ask questions like what is the probability of randomly selecting a thermometer that's reading between the freezing point uh, zero and this higher temperature 1.35 degrees. So this is kind of a standard question that we can solve by using this uh, standard normal distribution. Now if we want to go up to we want to go from 0 up to 1.35 we can break that up into the probability that we will be less than 1.35 minus the probability that we will be less than zero. Let's draw a picture here to get this idea completely. So the function that we have built in for us in R will take an et an x or z value as input, so something like 3.5 or perhaps 0, and give us the total area under the normal distribution below that point. So we could find this area here, or we could find this area here. What we want at the end of the day is a distribution that looks like this. that goes from 0 to 1.35, just including this area here. So we can find the area up to 1.35 and then get rid of, with some subtraction, the area up to 0 to get our desired range. Let me show you the way you would do this in R. So we can use the p-norm function. we can insert our x or z value as 1.35. Let's put in the mean, which is 0. The standard deviation is 1. So this will correspond to the first red shaded area here. Then we can subtract the similar thing, just starting at 0 now. So plugging these two numbers into R, we will get Uh, this large number here for the first one and for the second one we end up getting 0.5 on the dot and so this comes out to about 0.4115 or about a 41 percent chance of our thermometer lying in this particular range. Uh, it's interesting to note that this probability here for 
half of the curve. The total area for half of the area is 0.5 or half. Uh, that's because we require that the total area under the curve uh, from minus infinity to positive infinity should be 1. So we could have known beforehand that this half of the curve here is area half. Okay, uh, so that's part A. Let's go through and solve a couple more problems to get to grips with how this is working. So we can ask this question here. What's the probability of selecting a thermometer that reads exactly one degree Celsius? Uh, you may recall from earlier, there's no area associated with uh, just a single value. There's no range here. And so there's zero probability here since it's an exact value. Exact value has zero probability. So that would look something like this. Uh, this is a one-dimensional object. There's no area to it, just length. OK, let's try another one here. We can try and think about the area between minus 1.35 degrees and 0. We can solve this in a similar way. We could think about all of the area below 0 and get rid of all of the area below negative 1.35 using our p norm function. Uh, it turns out that uh, we can compute this value in this way, uh, but there is also a uh, different way to compute the area here. We could do this actually by means of symmetry by observing the problem above. So this problem here is looking for the area between negative 1.35 and 0. So that's this area here, 0 being here. The normal distribution is symmetric. These two values are actually the same. So by symmetry, the area in part C that we're looking for is actually the same as the area in part A. So you can note the symmetry and find the area that way, or you can plug these numbers into R, and again you will arrive at the same thing. So we can do it that way, or we can do it by symmetry. All right, let's do three more. So for the next one, let's think about the area between minus 1.35 and between 1.35. This can be done in a couple of ways. So we could use our functions in R by going all the way up to 1.35 and then subtracting what we would get if we go all the way up to minus 1.35. Alternatively, we can try another symmetry trick. Uh, this new area here seems to be the area we had in A plus the area we had in C. Uh, and because they're the same, it's also double of either of them. So we could simply combine areas from A and C. Uh, or maybe double uh, 
uh, part A, I guess, or double part C, since they're the same. In any case, uh, it, we could go maybe twice of this number here. And we'll end up with about 82%. OK, so that's part D. Uh, part E and F are a little interesting. So in part E, we'd like to find the area above 1.35. So we could represent that as this piece here. Uh, recall that whether or not we have the greater than sign or the greater than or equal to sign here, it corresponds to the same area. Now our function for r, the p-norm that we know how to use, will give us all of the area below. So we could find all this area using our p-norm function. Uh, but what we want is the red area shaded here. However, together all the areas should give 1. So if we think about taking one and then getting rid of this green area, that will leave us with the red area. So we can go one minus the probability that Z is less or equal to 3.5. The idea being that this probability here can be computed easily using our p-norm function, as we've done previously. And together, this will produce for us about 9%. So now you can find probabilities below a particular value, probabilities above a particular value, or probabilities between two particular values. Uh, these are the kinds of problems we would like to solve. There's one more thing I'd like to show you here. This next problem, F, is basically the same as the other problems, but backwards. So the question here is to find the 75th percentile. So we would like to separate out the bottom 75% of the data. Now, previously, we had a value we were interested in, and we wanted the percent. So in part E, they gave us the Z value. And at the end of the day, we found a percent about uh, 9 percent, uh, 8.9. In this problem, uh, it's being phrased to us in the opposite way. So we don't know the particular value on the z-axis that we would like, but we are requiring that the area under this curve here be 75 percent. Uh, so we start instead with temperature, or uh, with percent. So we start with a percent and we want the temperature at the end of the problem. Now for this we won't use the p-norm function. Uh, we'll use what you get when you flip the p-norm function, which I guess is the q-norm function. So we can use the q-norm function in R. This will take similar inputs. It will take p, uh, which will be different now. It will take mu and sigma, which are the same. The p here is a percentile, uh, or probability as a decimal. So something like 0.75 for us, where the output of this function will not be a percent. The output will be uh, temperature in terms of the original unit of the problem. So we can compute Q norm here. Uh, 
in this following way. And this will give us a number about 0.67. Now this output is not a probability, this output is a number in degrees. So this is saying that the cutoff point for the 75th percentile is about uh, 0.67 degrees Celsius. All right. So that uh, concludes the problems I wanted to go through. Uh, there's a few more in the notes which I have posted. Uh, you can go through the whole uh, rigmarole again, but using different mu's and different standard deviations. Um, by convention, we usually use x when we're dealing with non-standard normal distributions, but uh, it will be exactly the same, just that in the p-norm function, instead of supplying uh, the standard values of mu and sigma, you'll supply your particular values of mu and sigma. So have a look at that, and we'll see you in class.